Today we celebrate the Feast of the Presentation. This is a feast that is normally uh, not celebrated on a Sunday, but seeing as how it falls on a Sunday uh, this year, it trumps the, the ordinary time, for Sunday and ordinary time. And what a beautiful uh, feast it is. It's interesting as well that usually this, this feast day is celebrated uh, with a symbol of light. You're sometimes it's the blessing of candles. Of course, tomorrow is the same blaze day as well, the blessing of throats with, with candles. Uh, but the celebration of, of light, so the light shining forth, and how beautiful this weekend that finally the sun broke forth, right, as we celebrate uh, the presentation of the Lord. And so as we see that light, automatically we can already, already think uh, that's the light of Christ shining forth. This, this theme is even more prevalent, of course, in John's gospel, darkness and light. But also for the Feast of the Presentation, it's that light coming into the world of the presentation of Jesus at uh, the temple. So this presentation is, is according to remember, it's not, it's not the circumcision of the Lord. The circumcision of the Lord happened eight days after his birth. The presentation of the Lord is 40 days after his birth. And this is to, uh, once again, uh, to fulfill uh, the Israelite law, which was back in the day that you'd bring the child to the temple and the mother as well to the, to the temple uh, 40 days after the birth of the firstborn. And so this is actually is, is given to us back in Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, uh, this law of Moses concerning uh, the firstborns. What's this law? It's, it's during this time of Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. God gave to his people through Moses an ordinance requiring that every firstborn child to be born to Hebrew parents must be dedicated to the Lord. This requirement would constantly remind the Israelites of how all their firstborn children were spared from death by the blood of the Passover lambs on their doorposts. Remember that story of the, the Exodus, right? And the, and the spreading of the blood on the doorposts to signify that this is uh, someone of the, of the promised people. So their firstborn uh, were spared. But as they continue this celebration, continue this tr tradition as well, they now are called to present uh, this child, this firstborn, to the Lord. Because they owe their existence as a nation to God's supernatural protection of them. And so the firstborn child could be dedicated to God to serve as a priest or it could be bought back in a certain sense, the symbolism of being bought back uh, with the modest redemption offering. It's interesting in Luke's gospel, we hear that it was a, a pair of pigeons or a, two, a pair of turtles or two young pigeons. The other prescription of the law would actually be for those who had more means, more, more money, would have been a lamb to be offered up. And so from this, we can deduce as well uh, that, that Joseph and Mary did not come off uh, as, as very rich or having much means. And so they gave this, this modest offering of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. But when Joseph and Mary go to the temple, something amazing happens. And, and what happened was that they were greeted by Simeon and Anna, a man and a woman who represented all the righteous and devout people of Israel uh, were there actively, faithfully doing what? Awaiting the consolation of Israel. They recognized Jesus as the fulfillment of all their Masonic hope. The Holy Spirit revealed to both of them that this ordinary looking infant was anything but ordinary. What did Simeon do? He swept Jesus into his arms. How beautiful is that as well? This, this older uh, man who's been waiting for the redemption of Israel uh, takes this baby infant into his arms, and, and what does he say? This, this beautiful statement. Now, Master, may let your servant go in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, which you have prepared in the sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for your people Israel. So it's not only for the Israelite people, but also for the Gentile people uh, as well that God had promised his faithful man that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. With the prompting of the Spirit, Simeon knew God had kept his promise in this child. He went on to do what? He went to prophesy, prophetically describe the child's future. Jesus would be both a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for God's people, Israel. But he doesn't stop there. He speaks directly to Mary. This is very interesting. And he describes a shadow that would accompany this child's life, which would accompany Jesus's life. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that would be contradicted. The child's mission would stir up trouble and call for decisions that would create division and opposition. 
what mother wants to hear this. Imagine uh, your young child and you hear this about uh, your, your young child and you hear this about him. Of course, you're going to be filled with, with sorrow. And of course, there's even more. Simeon goes on to say to Mary, you yourself, a sword will pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. How difficult this must have been for a new mother and her first public maternal action to learn. Suffering for both her son and herself lay ahead. In fact, what Simeon was doing was bringing together many Masonic prophecies in this amazing benediction over Jesus and his mother. God's long promised salvation for the whole world was right here, lying as an infant in his arms. And Simeon says what? He will grow up to become the suffering servant of Isaiah's majestic prophecies in the Old Testament. God has even said this at the dawn in Eden. We hear this right away in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 15, that after the fall, that a woman and her seed would take up the definitive battle against his primordial enemy, the devil. So we have that fall of Adam and Eve and yet even then, we know we're going to be waiting for, for, that, for that woman who is Mary and her seed, which is Jesus, to bring redemption to the world. Simeon knew in fulfillment of all that God had early revealed that great pain and great joy lay ahead. And it's not only Simeon we hear about today, but it's also the prophetess Anna. It's interesting here as well, just a little side note, that today as we celebrate the presentation of the Lord, it's also a day in which we celebrate those who have consecrated their life to God, And so really just brothers and sisters uh, and deacons and priests as well, who have gone ahead and dedicated their life to the Lord because what we see in Simeon and Anna are people who are, are giving their whole life to God. They're spending day in, day, day out in the temple, uh, praying and waiting the redemption of Israel. And so we have this, the prophetess Anna, whom St. Luke identifies as of the tribe of Asher, is also prompted by the Spirit after, after a faithful life of prayer and fasting, to recognize the child as the one for whom all who are awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem sought. The tribe of Asher, by the way, had been one of the ten northern tribes that were lost when the Assyrians conquered them in God's judgment against their covenant unfaithfulness. We talked about that uh, last week, that the northern tribe, which then kind of wiped off the map, well, this is the tribe of Asher is, is one of these. And it's interesting that now with Anna, she's representing what? She represents God's intention to recover all that was lost to him through sin. Both Simeon and Anna saw in a tiny newborn baby the hope of the whole world. And it's fitting as well, by the way, that uh, this prophetic announcement about Jesus were made in the temple. This was the place intended by God for the most intimate contact between himself and his people. It was the holiest place on earth. For the Israelite people, there's no holier place than the temple. Why? Because it's where God visited his people on the Day of Atonement every year in the liturgical work of the high priest. Long before his earthly life unfolded, Jesus' work as both priest and victim were foreshadowed in this temple visit. Jesus would return to the temple, of course, at the beginning of his manhood and during the course of his public ministry. Eventually, what did he do? He prophesied its utter destruction. What a prophecy this is, right? Like, this is not something that any Israelite would expect to hear. This temple, the holiest of holy, and its utter destruction. Of course, the, the, the Levites and the priest held this against Jesus. So why would this happen? Why did Jesus prophesy and why did it happen? He was because he was born to become the new and living temple, where for all eternity, God and man would meet. And so Jesus becomes this new temple where God and man would meet. Where does this most explicitly happen? It happens in the Eucharist. Every single Sunday we're able to come here and receive Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist. And what we're called to do is to open ourselves up to him in all the graces that he desires to give us. Today we have a beautiful, beautiful psalm. It's, it doesn't sound like much when we first read it or look at it. It's Psalm 24, 24, and the whole psalm is beautiful, but the responsorial psalm is verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. 7 and 9 repeat themselves. But what the psalm was written was when David is writing about the triumphant entry of the Ark of the Covenant into 
the temple. This is interesting, by the way, that he wrote this because the temple had yet to be built. It was not built until uh, King Solomon, David's son, was the one who built it. But David already wrote this psalm for this triumphant entry of the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, coming into the temple. So what does it state? It states, lift up your gates, lift up, O gates, your lintels. Reach up, you ancient portals, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Who, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up, O gates, your lintels. Reach up, your ancient portals, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Even here in that last part, the, the king, the Lord of hosts, of course, the host of the Eucharist, being let into our soul, being let into our body. And so it's this lifting up, as we hear, of, of these gates, of these doors uh, to the Lord. I know it's a silly analogy, but I'm, I'm known for my silly analogies sometimes. I remember back in high school, I had the opportunity, and many of you did as well, uh, of going to the Metro. I actually had to play in the Metro, Metrodome a couple of times uh, for, for football. But the most amazing part of the Metrodome, the two greatest parts of the Metrodome are this. Leaving that horrible building was number one. And second off was going through those doors. Remember the doors at the Metrodome? If you were lucky enough, it was busy. You didn't have to go through the revolving doors. They'd open up those doors. And what would happen? It was kind of, kind of like an amusement park ride, right? You'd go rushing out those doors. If you want to be silly, you'd kind of stand there and try to hold yourself in as the air tried to, to push, uh, push you out. Well, imagine that happening uh, with, with a great gate, with a great door. You open it up, and what happens is this, this rush of air would, would push you out of so much force as well. And that's the same thing that we want to happen with our life when we open up our life to the Lord. Instead of having it rush out, we want the grace of God to, to rush in. But so often sometimes we can, we can seal out ourselves uh, against this. We can, we can kind of lock down our doors, lock down our hatchets, and not let anything in, not let anything penetrate us. And, and in doing this, what we're doing is we're blocking ourselves uh, from God. And so what we're called to do is, is to open up, to open up to him. How do we do this? Well, we're vulnerable with God. We let the Lord know that, that we, we need him, that we truly desire him. We want his presence to come into our life and to touch us in a profound and unique way. And once again, the most explicit way this is going to happen is when we come and receive the Eucharist. It's not just a piece of bread. It's not a piece of bread. It's Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist, the Lord of hosts. And he comes to give us light. He comes to give us grace. He comes to give us life, eternal life with him. Once again, that temple represented the holiest of holy. But Jesus came to and destroy the temple. Why? Because it's where in him, where God and man would meet. And that happens as well every single time we receive the Eucharist. That we're transformed. And that God becomes part of us and transforms our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. And so as we celebrate this presentation of the Lord, we acknowledge and we, we celebrate that the Lord has, has presented himself to the world, that Mary and Joseph uh, did this and brought him uh, to the temple, but also ourselves, that we too may continue to present ourselves to the Lord here at church every single Sunday and to receive him every single Sunday and to let him transform us into his grace, into his life, into his light.